Okay, hello everybody out there. Uh, welcome to the Institute of Physics Yorkshire Branch Lecture Series. I'm Professor Mike Rees from the University of Leeds and a committee member on the Yorkshire IOP branch. And one of my roles is to organize our lecture series. Welcome to our lecture. I'm uh, looking forward to our lecture this evening, uh, No Sleep Till Schrodinger by Professor Vlatko Vedron. And we also have a few people joining us behind the scenes. We have a Bethany Wooten, our branch support officer. So hello to her as well. Uh, this event is on, uh, on the Zoom webinar. Your audio and video won't be visible or audible to anyone. So there's no way you could accidentally appear on screen or have your audio heard. If you have a question for Professor Vlatko, uh, just type it in the Q&A box and we'll try to get to them all by the end of the talk. There is also a chat box where you can message us during uh, the webinar should you need any assistance. So interactive, here we go. I'd like to hear from you all in the chat box now. Go for it. Let us know who you are and where you're joining from us. Just to prove to us that this chat box is live and really works. Go on then, somebody say hello. Um, I'm gonna, if you don't, I'm gonna make it up and just pretend somebody said hello. Oh, hi, Michael from Sheffield, hello. Uh, uh, Akil from Birmingham, hello, Luke as well. These are real people saying hello. Hello, Nick as well from Chesterfield. Hello, hello, Josh from Leeds. Hello there. Mike from Staffordshire. I'm Mike. I was also from Staffordshire once. Hello, David from Berkshire. Pete said hi from us. Well, of course, it's the us are here. That's good. Uh, hello from London. The whole of London is here. This is wonderful. OK, so the chat definitely works. OK, uh, this lecture is also being recorded and will be uploaded to our IOP Regions and Nations YouTube channel to be enjoyed in the future. Um, Okay, I'm now going to introduce uh, Vlatko. Vlatko uh, is a professor of quantum information science in the Department of Physics at the University of Oxford. He has held a lectureship and readership at Imperial College London, a professorship at the University of Leeds, and holds visiting professorships in Vienna, Singapore, and Canada. Uh, Vlatko is known for his work on quantum entanglements and quantum information theory. He is a fellow of the Institute of Physics, which is the highest level of membership attainable for members of the IOP. Uh, Vlatko is the author of several books. I had a look on Amazon, uh, many books, uh, ranging from undergraduate textbooks to those for the layperson. I can't resist mentioning that decoding reality, the universe as quantum information can currently be purchased from Amazon for under six pounds. Anyway. Okay, we'd love for you to submit questions along the way, and I will keep these and ask uh, Vlatko at the end for you. So please use the question and answer box to submit your questions, and they'll be answered at the end of the session, hopefully. Mm -hmm. I will now hand over to Professor Vlatko Vedral. Uh, I will see you after the talk, the Q&A. Over to you, Vlatko. Thank you very much, Mike. It's a um, great pleasure to be um, speaking to you. I hope um, you can see the slides and I hope that you can hear me well. Um, I've um, taken the liberty to um, sex up the title a little bit. Um, um, I was inspired by all sorts of rock bands, I think, that like to use this title when they're touring, when they have a new album and um, they entitle it No Sleep Till whatever is the you know last place, Brooklyn or Hammersmith, the last place that they're going to have a gig at. Uh, it feels a little bit like this, this research, because, you know, people mistakenly think that um, um, music uh, and art is, is all about passion and creativity and science is a kind of dispassionate search for truth, but that's not at all like that. As you know, uh, scientists are as human as, as artists, and I think this requires as much passion, certainly, and ingenuity as, as anything else. I guess England uh, knows this uh, better than probably any other country. Anyhow, what I want to tell you about is the vision of quantum mechanics that we are taking from the microscopic world and really testing it in the macro domain. And the question really is whether all the quantum features will survive, and if not, which of them will survive and which of them may have to be really upgraded. It's all really inspired by ideas um, 
coming from Schrodinger, which is why I chose him here, but of course I will mention many others who've actually thought along similar lines. So let me let me give you the, the vision of the whole thing. It's sort of an interpretation of quantum mechanics, but I think it's the one that seems to be uh, the most robust one based on all of the um, experiments that we've been doing um, in the last 20 or 30 years. So, so the way I chose to, to talk about this is that ultimately really, um, the wave particle duality, you know, is everything a wave? Is it a particle? Is it sometimes a wave or sometimes a particle? Actually is ultimately, I would say, uh, won by the waves really. Um, the, 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 the crucial um, addition to the waves is that they're really quantum waves. And, and these are these famous Q numbers as Dirac called them, to make them distinct from just the normal um, real numbers that he called C, classical numbers. So Q numbers are weird because they have to be represented by these objects that are called matrices. That's, that was, of course, Heisenberg's contribution to quantum mechanics and how quantum mechanics started. Um, if you think about particles within this wave-like picture that everything is a quantum wave, then particles are actually a secondary concept. They are not really fundamental. The fundamental entities are these waves and particles are really just very specific formations, specific and stable wave formations, if you like. Um, and because everything is this weird quantum number that's got many aspects uh, present at the same time, when we engage in an experiment with a quantum object, we actually uncover only some aspects of reality, while all the other aspects that we know exist from our experiments cannot be seen at the same time. We may need a different kind of experiment to combine with, uh, with, with each other in order to reveal all of the aspects of reality. So that's kind of a very brief summary of what quantum physics is telling us. And I think this is more or less how Schrodinger would have summarized it um, himself. What was the big issue? So this is really the key thing to explain. Um, and it was a big issue in the early days of quantum mechanics. We are talking now late 20s, uh, more or less um, 100 years ago, where people were just getting used to the idea that everything is a kind of a quantum wave. Um, there were experiments, of course, that were done at that time, even earlier than that time, and also uh, decades later, which basically are uh, these famous cloud chamber experiments. These cloud chambers were, of course, 100 years ago, state of the art um, of uh, particle physics. Um, now, now I think you can watch a YouTube video and, and make it in your kitchen in, in, in 15 minutes. They're they actually very easy to uh, and fun to make. And here you have a particle that's at the bottom of this picture emitted. Uh, this particular shot, I think, is the alpha particle, the, the nucleus of the helium um, atom that has two protons and two neutrons. They, these particles come out and as they go through this cloud ch chamber, uh, what happens is that they interact with the molecules uh, of the gas. And every time the alpha particle hits a molecule of the gas, the molecule gets ionized. It attracts the neighboring molecules, which therefore condense. And actually you can visually see the condensation. These tracks are exactly the tracks that the alpha, alpha particle leaves as it scatters of these molecules in the gas one after another. And each of these straight lines is a separate experiment to do. You literally wait for a little bit longer than another alpha particle comes out and so on. And the question for these people and, and people like were, were struggling to understand this. The question was, if you're telling me really that everything is a wave and, you know, Schrodinger, Schrodinger equation, which describes all quantum objects as waves, then why do I see a straight line here? Why, why doesn't 
alpha particle leave a wave-like pattern of this kind. So this is just a picture that uh, someone took, if you, you know, if you dropped a, a small stone into a pond, then of course you would see these concentric waves that are symmetrically spread, spreading out in all directions. So why isn't this image um, of alt alpha particles exactly the same? And in fact, the solution to, to this it is really ingenious um, it, and it cuts, it goes to the heart of the quantum picture of reality. It was explained by various people. I think Heisenberg himself had an explanation. Darwin, uh, the grandson of Charles Darwin, a famous physicist Nobel laureate as well, um, had his own explanation. And finally, Mott, Neville Mott, wrote in, in 1930 um, an extremely famous paper, actually, which I would say most people would agree closes this whole discussion and explains these alpha particle paths, tracks inside this chamber. Um, Schrodinger talked a lot about it later and I think reached more or less the same conclusion. And that's something that we are going to talk about. But what I put in brackets in this slide to be a bit provocative is that it really all is down to Hamilton who lived maybe 50 years before this, his, his major contributions were, of course, in, in Hamiltonian in classical mechanics. He actually had his own formulation of Newtonian mechanics. But that formulation that Hamilton did, and that provided the basis for Schrodinger later, was the key, really, for me, uh, the, the, the key step in improving classical mechanics. And the way that Hamilton viewed particles is exactly like waves. The, the equations that Hamilton wrote down looked more like wave equations than like particle equations. And that really was the key to understanding, um, to understanding all, of this, um, all of this debate. And, and Schrodinger took this up and absorbed it and actually formulated his own equation literally based on this. So what Hamilton would have said is when you're describing a particle, you are writing down this, you're drawing these wave fronts, which is exactly what you would get from an expanding wave. But then what you're describing is really what the particle does, which is in fact a straight line, which is perpendicular to each of these wave fronts. This straight line is the path that the particle would take. This is in Hamiltonian classical mechanics. What quantum mechanics brings here, and that's really clearly seen in, in Mott's explanation, is that it's not that alpha particle takes a single of these paths, but it actually takes all of these paths simultaneously. It really spreads along all of these directions at the same time. And this is this famous concept of quantum superposition. So if you have a number of different ways in which a quantum particle can evolve, then quantum systems tend to evolve along all of these paths simultaneously. And that's the amazing explanation of Mott. Mott says, actually, it's not that the alpha particle takes only one path, but it takes all of these parts at the same time. And then the, then the question comes, why is it that when we look at it, we only see one of these parts at a time? So one particle will take one of these parts, the next particle you observe may take another part and so on. And the explanation here is exactly the explanation that I mentioned, that when we couple to a quantum system, we actually only have a view of one of these aspects of the quantum system. We cannot see the totality of the Q number in Dirac's word that describes all of these, but basically we, we can only see one aspect at a time. So we look at it, the first collision we see is basically a small cloud of condensation here, and that simply determines the fact that the particle will take this trajectory um, during our observation. Next time we look at it, of course, we may see a small cloud of smoke in a different direction of, of vapor, and that's exactly 
the, the, the trajectory that the next particle will take and so on and so forth. So basically when an observation takes place, when we couple to the quantum system through, through a complicated apparatus in this case, then what really happens is that this classical reality emerges as a kind of entanglement between us, the observers, and the vacuum, the cloud chamber, as well as the alpha particle. And that's really something that Schrodinger then took very seriously to develop his I think the person possibly who popularized this more than anyone else, in fact, I think including Mott and Schrodinger was, was Everett. And I think ultimately it's Everett's name that became attached to this. But I think um, uh, I think to be fair to, to all other people who have contributed to this, I would certainly emphasize Mott's contribution and Schrodinger's com contribution as, as much more important in many, in many ways. So whatever it really ultimately said is that a measurement within this context is simply creation of entangled states, highly correlated quantum states between the observer and the system that's being observed. But here, notice that there's no particular difference between observers and other systems like alpha particles. They're basically all described quantum mechanically within the same wave-like description. It's just interestingly that when one quantum wave entangles to another quantum wave, what you get is these branches within which you can talk about classical reality. So to put it in another positive provocative way to some people, classical reality, the classical world as we see around us, owes its existence to quantum entanglement. Cl classical reality, classical physics wouldn't even exist if the world wasn't ultimately quantum. Um, the nice thing why I like this is because it, it treats all of the objects, all of the physical systems in the universe on an equal footing. There isn't any difference between a living system, a conscious system, or an atom when it comes to these kind of physical interactions. And our reality, our classical reality, if you like, simply emerges as, as this kind of interconnected network of quantum entanglements. Schrodinger and Mott both emphasize that this picture is probably the most consistent way to think about quantum mechanics. And what they like is that there are no collapses here. Everything is nice and continuous. Everything is smooth. There are no quantum jumps. There is no spooky action at the distance at all. It's all happening locally and in a completely causal way. So to me, this seems, if you take quantum mechanics seriously and you extrapolate it and you're trying to understand the whole universe quantum mechanically, it seems to me that at present, this is the only way to go. And that, that really is what we are trying to test. And now, of course, the most famous thought experiment of, of all of these. And what I would like to tell you is that we are working on, on making this less of a thought experiment and, and more of a real experiment. But of course, it gets harder and harder when you evolve, involve more and more macroscopic and complex systems. And the question really is whether there is any limit to treating everything in this quantum mechanical superposed and entangled fashion. So as we all know, Schrodinger really uh, took this um, uh, living system, a cat, as an example. And he said, he said, Think about this, when, when, when an object like a cat observes a quantum event, then it seems to split according to this entanglement into different classical realities, which at a higher level all exist simultaneously. So that's actually how Schrodinger, who I believe initially thought that this might even be paradoxical. He certainly thought this was very counterintuitive and everyone at the time thought this was counterintuitive. But I think gradually with time, if you read Schrodinger's lectures towards the end of his life in the 50s, you will see that actually he changed his mind. He no longer thought about this paradoxical and he in fact thought that this was the only way to think about these things.
So, so here is this um, archetypal kind of uh, way of, of talking about it. You have a single quantum system. Usually we think of photons, the, you know, the simplest quantum particle that we can think of. You send this photon through a beam splitter where it splits and it goes down two different paths at the same time, just like an alpha, alpha particle. We could exactly do this with alpha particles. It makes no difference. Possibly the experiment is just slightly simpler with, with a photon and we can control this better. Now, what Schrodinger said is, he dramatized it even more, of course. He said, imagine the photon uh, hits a bottle with poison in one of these arms and the poison is released and ki kills the cat, while in the other part of the photon, there is nothing. We don't put anything there. There's no poison there. So the cat is nice and alive. What Schrodinger said is that if you treat the whole experiment quantum mechanically, then both of these options exist simultaneously. Uh, they are in this big entangled state. So the path of the photon the presence or absence of poison and the state of the cat, whether it's alive or dead, are all entangled. All of these properties become entangled quantum mechanically. So the photon starts as this Q number in Dirac's language. And initially, the cat is alive. It's in one and well-defined classical state. But as soon as the cat couples to this kind of quantum superposition, it inherits automatically the property of being in two states at the same time. It becomes a quantum number itself, as it were. And the whole experiment, if you describe it like this, is actually one huge entangled state. The question is, can we test this? And is this consistent with the fact that when we make a measurement in the laboratory, we only see one definitive outcome. We never, we never see a dead and alive cat at the same time and what i'm what i'm trying to explain now in fact what i will try to explain to you very briefly yes this is perfectly consistent with quantum mechanics it may seem paradoxical at first sight but in fact that exactly is what quantum mechanics tells us happens um, and now to tell you about a, a, a kind of more dramatic version of, of Schrodinger's cat. And I think this was first proposed by, by David Deutsch, by my colleague David from Oxford, who actually thought that you could really test whether a definitive observation has been made, as well as whether these observations, even though they look definitive, they actually exist in a huge big superposition in a large entangled state? And actually the answer is yes. Quantum mechanics says that in each of these branches, reality, classical reality where it used to exist, while overall as an umbrella, there is a full quantum mechanical state which exists exactly in this amazing superposition of being, you know, cats being dead and alive and so on. So what David suggested, and, and, and I, I, will, I will make a few comments about it later as well. How close are we to trying to test something like this? What David suggested is the following. He said, put a human being inside instead of a cat or together with a cat. And, and, and this Bob person here is the person who will enter the laboratory or who can be inside the laboratory from the beginning. And it's a person that's going to look at the cat and see whether the cat is dead or alive. And if you follow quantum mechanics, if you follow Schrodinger's analysis here, what quantum mechanics says is that actually there are two branches of the quantum state, one in which Bob is very happy because he's observing a, a living cat, the cat didn't get poisoned. And there is another branch in which Bob is very sad, presumably, and, and the cat is and, and there is no ambiguity about the state of the cat or the state of Bob's uh, consciousness or feelings or whatever else you want, might want to engage there. Now, how can someone test that Bob is perfectly comfortable in each of these realities while they actually exist simultaneously in a superposed state at the same time? 
The question is, how can that be done? And it can be done. And the idea is to have yet another physicist, Alice in this case, who, stand, who is sitting outside of the, of the experiment. And what she does is she prepares a piece of paper with the following question for Bob. She just inserts it underneath the door, if you like. And the question says, Bob, do you see a definite state of the cat? So here is, here is what I'm describing on this uh, slide. Alice simply asks Bob, do you see a definitive state of Felix, of the cat? Now, in both of these branches, Bob would take the piece of paper, read the question, and write yes. In the branch in which the cat is alive, he definitely sees a definitive state. The cat is alive. In the branch in which the cat is dead, he also sees a definitive state of the cat. Notice that Alice is being very smart. Alice is not asking Bob, do you see a dead cat or a live cat? Because then Alice herself would become part of this entangled quantum state. And she wouldn't be able to complete the second part of the experiment because she would join this hugely entangled state, which for her would then become irreversible. So she only wants to know how, the, how Bob feels, whether it's a definitive outcome. And of course, Bob would say yes, in both cases, he would put the piece of paper underneath the door and Alice would read this. Now, the second part of the experiment is simply to undo the whole first bit of the experiment. It would have to undo the photon that's splitting the cat that joins this state Bob also, did. so this would be a hugely, the reason why it is actually a difficult experiment is precisely because of this second part of the experiment. So once you've created two branches in a superposition, what a quantum experiment must do at the end is to unite them and put them together uh, to get interference. So every quantum experiment goes exactly the same way, make a superposition, and then bring it back to create interference. And the interference results tell you exactly what happened in between these two. So that's the difficult bit. But the funny thing is that you can now test if Alice undid everything, then of course, Bob would come back to the original state. He wouldn't even remember the experiment. The cat would now be alive. The photon would be simply at the beginning of the experiment not even having gone through the first beam splitter, everything would return back to, 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 the, to the initial state. And that, in fact, to us, would be a proof, if this happened deterministically, would be a proof that Bob was really in two branches, halfway um, in the experiment, in two branches, but the piece of paper that wasn't undone, that Alice could still hold at the back at the end of the experiment, would simply testify to the fact that Bob made a definitive observation. While the fact that we could interfere these two possibilities at the end of the experiment tells us that they really existed at the same time. So it's a kind of crazy twist on Schrodinger. And you can see, of course, why, why we need to engage um, a human being. Um, or, or, or something similar in this experiment, because we really want to query how the person feels. We need to be able to have a reliable communication with the inside observer, the observer who is sitting inside the laboratory. So the interesting thing is, is that halfway through the experiment, we are talking about a highly entangled state. I think this is just a short digression. Um, th these are knots. This is a mathematical structure of knots uh, called the Borromean rings, which actually perfectly mathematically capture the entangled state of the photon and the poison and the cat and Bob in, in this experiment. It's such a highly entangled state that if you disturb any of these elements, if you remove any of these rings, in the Borromean structure, the whole structure falls apart. And, and the analog in physics of this falling apart of the structure is what we call decoherence. The difficult bit of doing this quantum experiment is really to maintain 
this ginormous quantum entangled state for long enough to complete the whole experiment. Anything else that interferes with this, that basically learns whether you are in one or the other branch of this superposition would actually be a detrimental effect. It's something that we call decoherence is of course exactly what we are battling when we are trying to make larger and larger quantum computers. We are really trying to isolate them well enough that nothing else in the environment that's unwanted couples to that um, system. Now, if you want to talk about the logic of this, and, and this is actually partly what I'm doing now in, in Turin in Italy. I'm uh, trying to um, discuss this with, a, with an experimental friend of mine, Marco Genovese, who actually execute the logical, uh, distilled logical version of this experiment. And you might be surprised to learn, again, this goes back to the beauty of quantum mechanics, that the way that quantum mechanics describes the simplest physical system is exactly the same as it describes the whole universe. There is a beautiful unifying, um, unifying power to quantum formalism. In this case, we are only talking about three quantum bits. So you can do it actually the whole experiment, logically speaking now with just three photons. And I don't want to take you really through the, through the details of, of this picture. What you have to really execute is a sequence of gates on these three quantum bits. And the first gate would be the one that creates the superposition of the photon. The second gate, which is a controlled not gate would create an entangled state. This is the equivalent of creating an entangled state between the photon and, and Bob, if you like, in, in that experiment. The third set of gates simply confirms that Bob um, and the photon are in the same state in each of these branches. So if the photon is on the left-hand side, Bob has detected the photon on the left-hand side. If the photon is on the right-hand side, Bob has detected the photon on the right-hand side. So it's basically all nice and consistent. And then the last bit of this experiment is the one when you undo the whole operation, you reverse the whole thing and you bring it back to the initial state. And if you successfully brought it back to the initial state, that actually verifies quantum mechanics. That really means that halfway through this experiment, you had a huge, so in, in, in the case of the cat, in this case, it's a very small superposition because it only involves quantum bits. So this is something that every, almost whatever platform you look at these days, you will be able to, to manipulate three uh, quantum bits for long enough um, in this case, to, to execute maybe five or six very basic quantum gates. So logically speaking, this is a simple experiment, but if instead of qubit two and qubit three, you want to have two living systems, then of course, it becomes much more complex. And, and it becomes complex because it's difficult to eliminate all the unwanted influences, any other environmental noise, could actually uh, destroy your superposition. And that really is the, the key difficulty for us. So it's very, very similar to scaling up quantum computation. Now, here is another twist to the story. And, and I'm telling you this because people don't realize that if you take quantum physics seriously, then, then it really has many beautiful twists and turns. So one of these so far has been that Bob in each branch of the quantum state sees a definite outcome. Bob is not confused about whether cat is alive or dead. While Alice, who is outside of that entangled state, knows that Bob exists in two states at the same time. That really sounds a bit crazy, but I'm gonna get even crazier now because what you can do before you, before you interfere, before you undo this big superposition, what Alice can even do, she can look at the piece of paper, Bob's answer, she can say, ah, I see that you see a definitive state. Then she can send him another message, which says, Bob, I know you see a definitive state of the cat. It's either dead or alive, as far as you can tell. But I'm telling you 
that the whole laboratory in which you exist actually contains two parallel quantum realities, two classical realities in this huge quantum entangled state. So it's very weird because Bob would know that he sees an alive cat. And at the same time, Alice would be telling him that there is a copy of him which sees a dead cat, which simultaneously exists in a position with the first possibility. And not only that, Alice can then do the, the rest of the experiment, which would demonstrate that these two possibilities exist at the same time. And, and wh why is this, why does, why does this sound um, really interesting? Because of the, of, the, um, of the statement that I made at the end of this slide, which actually is one of the defining features of quantum mechanics. It says unknown outcomes can also affect future measurements. And that sounds really crazy. How can that be? How can something I didn't even observe in an experiment affect the future, my future? And the answer is simply the previous um, experiment that I showed. So basically, Bob can see a, a live cat but Alice is telling him that there is another branch in which the outcome is a dead cat. He doesn't see it in this particular branch, but when she combines the two branches, they will interfere together to give a third definitive outcome. So even the outcomes that we don't observe could quantum mechanically in principle affect the future measurements that we make. And, and that really sounds, sounds mind blowing to me. That really is, if you take quantum mechanics seriously and you apply it to everything as Schrodinger would, would have us do, of course, then, then this is exactly what you, what you obtain. Now, I want to give you a bit of a, a just a, a bit of a, an intuitive ex explanation of how, how does this, how does this actually work at the, at the logical level? How can Alice how can Alice tell that Bob is really in an entangled state without destroying this entangled state, without destroying the two possibilities that exist at the same time? And one nice way which I thought about was, was that it actually is a logical equivalent. What we are doing now with quantum gates and quantum operations is the same as in this famous paradox which I think most of you would be familiar with, where you, have, where you have these two brothers standing in front of two doors, and one of these brothers always lies and the other one always tells the truth, but you don't know which is which. And you want to know which of the two doors it's safe to go through. One of the doors is safe, the other door will, will lead you to some kind of disaster and, and catastrophe. So how can you, you can only ask them questions to which they can reply with yes or no. The question is, is there a question to ask them so that you know definitely which door is safe and which door is not safe? And it's exactly the control not gate in quantum mechanics is exactly the analog of this. I called it a parity check. So what you're trying to see is whether the two brothers agree on which door is a safe door without even knowing which of the two brothers is a liar and which of them is a truth teller. It's exactly the same in quantum mechanics. You are trying to ascertain whether each of the copies of Bob sees a definitive state, but you don't know which one is which. You don't know whether Bob sees a living cat or a dead cat. It doesn't matter. What you are ascertaining is that they are consistent within their own realities. And that's amazing. I think that's exactly what quantum mechanics at this level um, does for us. And then, of course, I'm using this Alice in, in, in Wonderland analogy where I'm saying, well, why not, why not go further? Why stop there? You know, and down the rabbit hole we go. Because now you have the, the mad hatter who could even be an observer that's even outside of Alice's observation domain. And so basically, Alice could be conducting this experiment, and then she could be communicating to the mad, mad hatter what she sees. And if she tells him, oh, I asked Bob, Bob tells me that he sees a, a, a dead cat, then mad hatter would now join this huge entangled state as well, and basically exist in one branch in which everyone consistently sees 
one state of the cat and another branch at the same time in which all of the observers agree that they see a different state of the cat. And this is something that's known as Wigner's friend. Wigner was another physicist, of course, who was, who was um, uh, grappling with all of these things. He had all, all sorts of views of his own about quantum mechanics and what it means. And here I'm using this metaphor of a painter that's trying to replicate the, um, um, the forest around himself, but at the same time, he wants to also insert himself in the painting. Um, and of course, um, if he puts one copy of himself in the painting, then he realizes that that's not quite truthful to the, to the, to, to the exact uh, nature of, of his reality because he's missing the painter that painted the first painter and so on and so forth. And quantum measurements uh, in this kind of picture are very much like that. It's just that all of these realities actually exist simultaneously. So in this picture, I would say you are representing one branch where these friends are agreeing on one particular reality. If you now multiply by all possible realities that you can have simultaneously, that's kind of what, what quantum physics is, uh, is telling us. Maybe a way to, uh, before I show you a couple of experiments and then I'm, I'm, I'm going to conclude um, so what we would really like to do is a, is a kind of experiment of the type that I described. Um, um, sometimes we, we really, uh, we, when you read about uh, quantum physics, the way it's sometimes popularized um, is, is to use Bishop Barclay and his famous question, you know, uh, the, 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 the tree falling in the forest and does it make a sound if there is no one to hear it and so on. Uh, one of my colleagues, I think um, David Mermin said, does the moon, or I think he, he was quoting Einstein, does the moon exist when no one is looking at it and things like that. So this somehow implies uh, that quantum uh, reality only exists when we are observing it. And, what I'm trying to tell you now is that it's the exact opposite. Quantum reality is anti Berkeley, actually. Reality in its totality only exists when no one is looking at it, actually. So that, that is exactly the whole point, that when two quantum objects couple to one another, then only certain realities can emerge but none of these branches can actually have access to the other branches. So that's interesting. So when, when you engage with a quantum wave, you kind of distill one aspect of that wave, but you've neglected all the other aspects. Now, of course, if you apply quantum mechanics to yourself, as Schrodinger is, is telling us we ought to do, then you yourself also exist in this multitude of realities. And the experiment I showed you would be the one that I think would be, be excellent to test this. Now, where are we and what are we trying to do uh, in this regard? Incidentally, every quantum experiment is more or less a version of Schrodinger's cat experiment that I showed you. So I think all quantum experiments ultimately boil down to make a large superposition do something to this superposition and then undo all of these different elements and put them together, interfere them quantum mechanically. So what we are trying to really do is make experiments with more and more complex systems. First of all, inanimate systems, because we are trying to test quantum mechanics um, in, in other domains, especially with gravity. Because as, as most of you, again, would know gravity has not been quantized yet. We don't understand exactly whether it is quantum, how to treat it quantumically. But if Schrodinger is right, then certainly we will have to quantize gravity. And some of, some of these um, experiments that are at the simplest level of quantum gravity are almost already accessible to us. So that's certainly one frontier, one portal into, into testing this kind of quantum reality. Experiments with living systems, um, of course, are very important as well because we don't know really whether living systems can be described quantum mechanically. There are all sorts of theories out there that quantum mechanics collapses when it interferes with life. Wigner himself, I think, held this view, but I would say we are currently almost certainly 
um, um, not prepared to believe anything like that. I'm guessing that reality really uh, is quantum mechanical, at least at some basic level. Um, coming back to Schrodinger's experiment of, with Alice and Bob, it seems to me that the most realistic way to go, and I think that's what David imagined in, 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 the, in, in the paper that I, that I mentioned that he wrote some time ago, is that before we, we are able to really do this with a human being and interfere anything in this very complex way, we are probably more likely to do this with artificial intelligence. And I'm putting it as a question mark, maybe it's going to be a quantum computer that's simulating some kind of artificial intelligence, some kind of consciousness, call it whatever you like. We, we don't really understand how this ought to be done. But I think it's possible that even a small, relatively small quantum computer, which with say 1000 quantum bits or 1 million quantum bits can actually uh, become conscious. We don't know. If we control this well enough, and if we understand what it is that we ought to be doing really to simulate the conscious system, it seems to me that this kind of Schrodinger cat experiment um, will in fact be done probably with an AI. Um, and, and I don't think that's, that's gonna be too far in the future, simply because the, the, the rate of progress in quantum technologies is, is really amazing. Of course, whether we get to this level where we where we're confident enough that we have something that resembles intelligence, it, it's a very it's a very deep question. And, and of course, no one has an So what we've been doing on this road to Schrodinger, if you like, uh, we have actually a couple of specific things that we would like to do, but one of them is to entangle two living systems. So basically, not quite having two human beings, but to take two very simple systems. In this case, this is a, a picture of a bacterium that a colleague of mine, Dave, calls um, entangled to light, to photons. This was already a few years back. He put this bacterium between two tiny mirrors, which was separated by a, by a micron, tiny separation. You cannot even see it with the naked eye. He inserted the bacterium there, he injected some light, and then he observed, he observed um, the, the light that comes out of it. And what was very interesting is that the bacteria that he did these experiments with were alive, as well as at the same time entangled to the light between these two mirrors. So it's perfectly possible to have an, a relatively complex entangled quantum state while the system that you are doing this with is actually alive. And I don't want to bore you too much with, with all of these images, but they're basically, the images I'm showing here are quantum signatures really of the fact that the state between photons in the cavity and this bacterium is a highly entangled state. Most recently, so I'm trying to, to kind of bring you up to the state of art, um, um, in, in, in this direction, a colleague of mine, Rainer Dumke, in, in Singapore, what he did is actually took a superconducting quantum bit and he um, coupled a tardigrade. Uh, he chose a tardigrade. This was a living tardigrade, again, a much more complex system than a bacterium, almost a millimeter in size. And you can see that there are two capacitor plates in this image and the tardigrade is inserted between these two capacitor plates that are part of this superconducting quantum bit. So somehow this was a hybrid quantum bit. It was part inanimate and part living matter. And actually when Reiner did all of these experiments, he could do all sorts of qubit manipulations with this kind of half living, half dead system that you could do with a normal qubit. And even more importantly, what he could do actually is take another superconducting qubit and entangle it to this qubit, initial qubit with the tardigrade. So this is, again, if you think of this in terms of three qubits, if you distill just a bare logic um, out of this, and you think of the tardigrade, this is a gross oversimplification, of course, but if you think of a tardigrade as, as just a quantum bit, and you have two other superconducting quantum bits, then effectively, logically speaking, this kind of implements the, the Schrodinger uh, experiment. Of course, 
what we are not able to do is interact with the tardigrade, ask tardigrade how it feels to be in this kind of interesting quantum state and so on. So it's clear that we need, we need an entity that we actually know how to definitively get answers from and, and understand better. But you know, this is a first step in that direction and we're thinking of, of scaling all of these things up. Finally, what, what I said we're trying to do, and these are the last two things, we, we've been very lucky to be funded by, by the Martin School initially at Oxford, now the Moore Foundation. Over the next five years, I think they gave us about three, $2.53 million to, to actually do this experiment. And the experiment is exactly the same interference experiment as, as in Schrodinger's cat, but now having two bacteria sitting in these optical cavities and making an entangled state between them. So this would be an interesting experiment because it would be a first experiment that creates a quantum entangled state between two living entities. I think it would be a milestone. What it would tell us um, is, is, of course, different. Um, it would tell us, um, at least at the basic level, that there is no conflict between thinking about living systems, fully functional living systems, and the possibility in being, uh, being uh, in a highly entangled uh, quantum state. So unlike maybe what um, Niels Bohr or Wigner or other people in the early days thought that maybe biology will put a stop to quantum mechanics and living systems will somehow collapse quantum states, what we are really trying to prove here, at least show experimentally, is that this probably is not true and living systems could be just as entangled as anything else. The key, of course, difficulty is whether we can keep them in this state for long enough to confirm that, simply to isolate them from any noise. And the second frontier that I think is very important to us in, in, in physics is to do a similar experiment with gravity. So. Here, you would most likely be doing this with the inanimate objects. You could do it with living systems as well, if, if you think they're suitable enough. But you're trying to make two massive super, two objects in a superposition while coupling to one another gravitationally. And then, uh, together with Chiara Maletto, my colleague Chiara Maletto, and our colleague Sugato Bose at UCL, we, we actually thought of an experiment that would, at least at the basic level, show that some aspects of gravity must in fact be quantum mechanical. And I think this experiment is, is also logically speaking equivalent to Schrodinger's cat experiment. You've got really one superposition simultaneously affecting another superposition to create again a highly entangled state. But in this case, unlike in the previous case where photons light the electromagnetic field is the mediator that mediates this entanglement. Here, it's actually the gravitational field. And the same way that we know that the electromagnetic field has got to be quantum mechanical, if it can entangle things, you would actually conclude here that the gravitational field would have to be quantum mechanical. So I think the two big questions for us pushing quantum mechanics from the micro into the macro domain are really living systems, how do we describe them? Are they fully consistent quantum mechanics and gravity? And I'm very excited that actually we're working on these things and I'm very happy to, to keep updating you with this progress, which, which I'm hoping within five to 10 years we'll really have some um, conclusive answers to these questions. So very brief summary. It seems to us that quantum mechanics, the trend of our experiments is such that it seems that quantum mechanics applies to all objects with no limitations. Measurements are in this picture, nothing special. They're simply entanglements. Um, there is a perfect consistency uh, between quantum mechanics and living systems. And now, of course, there is a question of whether the same consistency exists between gravity and quantum physics. And I will stop here and thank you for your attention. I'll give you a round of applause there, Vatko, just because uh, you can't hear your live audience. Thank you.
Um, okay, so uh, if you've got any questions about that, if you now use the Q&A feature and put them in there, I can then forward them uh, to Vlatko. Uh, and just while we're waiting for people to do that, um, uh, if you put a question in the chat, uh, please transfer it to the Q&A so I can see it in there. Okay, I, I have... Um, so while we're waiting, let me ask you a question, if that's all right. Of course. Uh, these parallel universes, they exist and they are as real as this one is that we're talking to now. There's no, there's no preference, is it? It's just as real as this, of course. Yes. But what I don't understand is they, for, for all this, these, uh, for them to superimpose, they have to mathematically add together in some way. I, I don't get in my head how different realities add together. You see what I'm saying? How do they add together? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And I think this exactly uh, lies at the heart of all of these discussions about the meaning and the foundations of, of quantum mechanics. So I think you have to end up talking about reality in a relative way, in the sense that each of these, um, each of these people in this case, but it doesn't have to be a person, of course, each of these objects in each branch feels as consistent and as coherent as in any other branch. Um, however, if you say something like, um, oh, I've observed a certain state, I've observed a, um, uh, an alive um, cat, the mistake you would be making within quantum mechanics is to assume that this is um, a truth that's independent of you, and it simply applies to everything in the universe. If you assume that, this would be actually equivalent to collapsing the state. You would assume that what you see is what everyone else must see. And this simply fails in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, you must mathematically, as you said, exactly add all of these realities, which within their own kind of structure are perfectly real to their own constituents, while actually outside of their structure, they exist simultaneously. So they are not real, if you like. Okay, <laughs> that's a bit mind blowing. Now we have got a question from the Q&A. So, and it says, uh, what is the likelihood that this, what you've been talking about, could be used in a wider context or in information exchange? Yes, I think this is, a, this is an excellent question because, uh, because I think the whole, um, the whole point of quantum information and quantum computation is exactly to capitalize on this property. So you really want your information to be defined in a relative way in, the, in these branches. You, you want a bit to have a definitive value, but only within one branch and exist in all of these different values across these multiple realities. And I think that's the key um, to quantum technologies, being able to, main, uh, to maintain this kind of quantum state, a suspended state, if you like. So it's suspended overall, even though within each branch, it looks like a very definitive reality. Okay, we've got another question. The previous one was from Akhil, if I say the name correctly. Uh, the next one is from Luke, Luke Ford. It says, when you say we need to reset the experiment for part two with Schrodinger's cat, what do you mean by that? Okay. In reviving the cat if it's dead or excellent question it's really uh, a question yes i think you, you you've exactly um um you've exactly identified the difficulty because that's why of course we are going to be doing these experiments with a handful of qubits first um and to explain it with uh, with uh, with qubits what you would simply do is make a superposition of one qubit couple it to another qubit, which then joins this superposition, if you like. So both of them, for instance, have a value zero, and at the same time, in the other branch, they have a value one, and you're keeping it simultaneously in this case. Now, going backwards means executing exactly these two operations in the opposite order. So first, you have to disentangle them, and then you have to undo the first superposition that you made. And that actually means to, that's equivalent to interfering these two possibilities in quantum um, mechanics. Now, in the Schrodinger cat experiment, you are absolutely right. 
uh, that's why this sounds like science fiction even now. It didn't just sound like science fiction to Schrodinger. You would literally have to revive the dead cat in one of these branches and bring it back. And, you know, a, a, a friend of mine jokingly calls this the Lazarus operator, you know, because in quantum mechanics, everything is done through operators. So, of course, you know, for us to, I think, I think the experiment would not be um, probing being dead or alive. You would instead simply probe whether the whoever is observing this is seeing the photon going through one port or the other. So I wouldn't try to make it as dramatic as dead and alive, because then you are right. We have no idea how to re revive people. Maybe we will one day. But we don't need to do that for this experiment. All you need to do is ask the human inside whether they see that the photon has gone through a definitive output port. And so in one branch, Bob would say, yeah, I see the photon on the left, or I see my computer telling me the photon is on the left. The other branch is the on the right, and that's it. So yes, th this is an excellent point. Um, we'll end with one. There's one final question that I've been asked. So I'll, I'll, this will be our last question, everybody. This is from Akil. It says, uh, there are hypotheses by physicists like Brian Green that the interaction between quantum mechanics and living systems could lead to the creation of technologies such as teleporters. And he's just asked, or she's asked, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I, I think so. I think the idea really here is that um, uh, when we speak about teleportation, uh, we know that this is a possible protocol. Um, theoretically, of course, we've executed it with very simple systems. Um, it would be an amazing challenge to do this with a complex living system. There would immediately be a question whether you could even maintain this state of being alive. Would the replica be exactly the same behaving living system? But it seems to me that this would be a technology in the future. It is possible. It would look probably even more like a hybrid technology that I was showing where you're trying to couple quantum bits directly with living systems and create this hybrid information processing systems. Okay, wow. Um, all right, so we've gone past our eight o'clock and I apologize to everybody who's still here. So I'll just end by saying thank you to Professor Vlatko for joining us uh, this evening. Yeah. And for the audience, we'd love to have you all join us in future events. And you can find out about them on events.iop.org. Uh, once this webinar closes, there's a quick survey to hear your thoughts about this talk. Please let us know what you think. It will appear after you leave the webinar and will help us to plan and to organize future events. From me and Vlatko, goodbye. Goodbye, thank you. Goodbye.